and the audio. It's good. We're hot. We're hot. Hey, okay. All right, real quick, sponsors. Head over to www.johnbartoloshow.com. Go check out the list of all the sponsors and everything going on with the show. I want to thank Gallo Tech for the walls behind us, Rhino Metals for all the tables and everything, all the furniture in here. Special thanks to Blackwater Ammunition, Right On Optics, and of course, Galco Leather Holsters. Links are all down below everywhere in every episode. Go check them out. Please leave reviews everywhere podcasts are heard. I appreciate everyone. I appreciate everyone taking the time to listen. Today's episode is super special. We got something that I think uh, a lot of people are going to enjoy. This is going to be unique. We got an esteemed panel. <laughs> we got the one and only, the lovely, Jessica Govin. We got Matt Wolf from Enforced Weapon Lights. And of course, Jonathan Turnbow. <sighs> Listen, we all come from exciting fields of influence in and around the trade show, gun industry, blah, 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 blah. Everybody's famous. We're going to dive right in. We're going to go around the horn. I'm going to start with Jonathan. I'm going to start to my left. We're going to, this is going to be hot. <laughs> Does SHOT Show happen? Should it happen? Why or why not? SHOT Show does not happen. It should happen. Why? And that's for all the small companies in the, in, in the industry. All the guys that need SHOT Show to happen to get those orders going. Mm. To get their faces out, right? That's for the lower floor companies that have to have SHOT Show to keep their business. Not just flatlined but up and up um no shot show doesn't happen <laughs> i don't think it does why uh covid will be used as the excuse but the success the industry's seen um most of the major players that are at shot show with big booths don't need to spend that money to have the success this year and that's what five hundred thousand dollars Budget it out for big companies, you know, for easy sometimes you're, more. Yeah, you're a hundred thousand to mm. three quarters of a million dollars for that, shot show. That's not it. Oh, for some people, Jessica. Well, well, yeah. well, all right, all right. Listen, it could be millions for some people. It's a lot of money at shot. And I'm saying the that big booth, that expense the big ones. this year is not going to move the needle as much or at all compared to other years. Or, I mean, you just don't have to try really hard right now to sell things. So that's my thought. Matt? Does SHOT Show happen? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen this year. Uh, I agree. They'll probably use COVID as an excuse. Yep. Yep. Does it need to happen? Um, you're right. I don't, I don't think companies have to try very hard. Everyone's got massive back orders right now. Yep. Um, you can take that half a million for some companies, multi-millions for, for other companies, uh, and put that in other places. And I think be a lot more effective with it right now. Uh, I think the attendance, even if it does happen, is just going to be extremely low. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the companies that do exhibit there are going to see such reduced traffic. Um, listen, your expenditure is the same. Get the booth out there. Get your people out there. Um, you know, your food, your hotel. If you're going, you're spending it anyway. Uh, and I think the return is going to be very, very little. Agreed. It's your turn. I feel like I should be the uh, optimism of the bunch. <laughs> no, go ahead. I know where you're going to come from. Go uh, ahead. Does it happen? I agree. It probably will not, and COVID will be the excuse. Um, but selfishly, from an outside the industry perspective, I was really hoping that if there was any group that was going to have their show and set the tone for 2021 moving forward with shows, that it's possible and we can do it safely, yada, yada, that it would be this group, but... Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen, and I think we'll find out pretty late, pretty late in the game. So, Now, here's the question, Jessica, because you're the expert at the table on this. Let's say it doesn't happen. Let's mm -hmm. take the contrarian viewpoint that it doesn't happen. And I agree with what you just said. I do. I think everybody in hopes, wishes it could be pulled off. The reality is an edict came out from the state of Nevada that oh, the way I read it, and I thought NSSF was crazy for publishing it, they, they put it out there. They said that 250 people was like the cap 
for, it was really stupid, in my opinion. It would be hard yeah. to pull that off. So what I say to you is, if SHOT Show doesn't happen, this is a question we all have, what should companies be doing and what are the right steps? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of stuff. And I know the last time I was here, I said, you know, virtual trade shows were not my favorite, but I am in the th- middle of one right now that it's it's not a flat boring conference we've actually made like think call of duty that environment for this client's product it's a 3d immersive experience where you go in and can do a bunch of stuff with it not like a flat go watch a you know pre-recorded video type of scenario also i have a lot of um customers and i i know that mobile trailers exist in the industry but they're not done in a manner where it's think outside of commercial you're targeting your customer that you're going to who actually purchases from you and like still writing deals we're activating a lot of mobile roadshow type of things so those are two options we can still have the smaller events it's just got to be you doing your own thing forget about the shows just take your brand on a tour go do your Mm. own shows your own activations your own events um and target a very specific customer that way And, and that's something Matt. we 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 talked about last night we were talking about it at length, and I know, John, that we've talked about it, but it's a good transition to you, Matt. You took steps this past year to do your own event, this past couple of years, yeah. especially hitting its stride, you know, getting it together. That's what we've talked about of where it needs to go mm-hmm. and what it needs to be and what it needs to look like. Why are some brands so reluctant to do it, and what's all involved, and what's the fear hurdle, I guess? I think a lot of companies are, are afraid to take that leap. Um, we did it. It was a little scary. Um, we did it two years in a row. And was it, you know, absolutely successful? Uh, you know, there, there's some good things that came out of it. Uh, it's a lot of planning. It's, uh, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of time. There's a lot of coordination that has to happen. Um, you know, and we're, we're a fairly small bunch. We don't, we don't have 500 employees. So every time we're trying to plan that, it's taking away from something else that we're mm-hmm. doing. Mm. And it, it took us, I mean, I would say it's probably a good six, seven months to do a one day event, right. you know, and it was a little trial by error and some things worked out well, some things, you know, not so well. We learned and, uh, you know, next year was, was better. Um, but to get back to why you think people are afraid, uh, it's a leap. It's a, it's a leap of faith to put yourself out there and, and, to, uh, you know, do something like that. But I think if we don't start owning our own brand and owning the own, the direction we go in, uh, we keep relying on, magazine ads or trade shows or the same old, same old, uh, it's going to get old and you're not going to stand out and you're going to be left in the dust. Mm. Jonathan, you've always been the consummate event planner in the group. You never skimped on the food and I always respected you for that. (laughs) Never skim on the food. Never. (laughs) Actually, that's a big part. We could spend an hour on that (laughs) and companies that fuck up the food. But that's always been something that's important to you. What do you see and why do you think there is a reluctance for brands? And beyond the money, what's the fear hurdle you see that brands try to overcome in putting together an event or staging something at shop? Because you've done one every year for as long as I've known you. I don't think, I mean, like, uh, like Matt said, like it's, it's a big investment in time, in people, in talent even. You know, like it's, it's not just something anybody can do. And on top of all of that, I think the biggest key potentially is, is just companies not having the relationships to make that happen because you got to have a lot of support from other companies in the industry. You absolutely do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have those relationships, it's going to be a subpar event. Now I want to go back around the horn from you back around starting with a topic that I know a lot of companies screw up on or we, something we spend hours on. What is it about ambassador programs and where ambassador programs fail? And what is it that companies, what's the biggest misconception about ambassador programs and where they go south? Mm. (laughs) Careful. (laughs) Um, The food at events is so much easier. It was, right? (laughs) Good Texas barbecue. Uh, Man, my, my first thought when it comes to a good influencer ambassador affiliate program my first thought is dan Mm -hmm. at vertex Mm -hmm. right that's my first thought because dan did that successfully at vertex and then he threw it over over at zevtech now 
and and he's had a lot of success at that. But what's the biggest misconception or error that people do? Um, I think right away is probably trying to get that success and just start it from the beginning and achieve that success without building the relationship with the affiliates first. You know, you have to have that relationship in place to then try and monetize that. And that's the biggest thing is you've got to be able to monetize it. You've got to be able to see the return on your investment without ruining their brand because none of those influencers are trying to be salesmen. Mm -hmm. And the content only works if it's organic and doesn't come across sales pitchy or commercially. So I don't know. That's a, that's a pretty pretty big question, but I think that's probably what I would go with is just the uh, – well, I ask it because I think, and, and I, I turn it over to Matt, who's 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 at a stage in his his company, a phase that he's done a lot of those things, and where it goes from here, and what the next steps are. I think if shot doesn't happen, and we're all of that thinking, what are the next steps people take, and what do they do, and where does it go from here? And is it pouring money into advertising? Is it more ambassador programs? How do company? And we'll get to how what we think companies should do to get it right. But what are those steps and what do they look like as it pertains to whether it's an ambassador program or shot doesn't happen? How do you get the word out, you know, mm. about your brand and how do you take your brand to the next level? Is it still sticking to your guns and doing your own event? Do you ramp up your ad spends? You know, it, it, what's the answer? Well, listen, we've had we've had influencer and ambassador programs. And I think to go back to what Jonathan said, for an ambassador program to work, you really got to have the right fit. You can't just pick anybody because they're X, Y, Z. If they don't fit with the brand, they don't work with your brand, whatever image you're trying to get out, then you're, you're just throwing money down a hole. Mm. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had some good ones. We have some, we've had some not so good ones. Um, but an ambassador can be, you know, very, uh, very beneficial. Um, I think the biggest misconception is that it's instant. That, okay, mm. well, we have, you know, Mr. or Mrs. X, uh, and it's just gonna, everyone's gonna buy our product, everyone's gonna love us, and they're gonna do all the work for us. And that's, that's quite the opposite. You know, it's not instant, it's a slow burn. Right. And it's gotta be built up. Jessica, I ask the same question a different way. At shows, everybody's looking for a gimmick, right? And we've talked about this, they're looking for a gadget. This is a great question for you. Okay. I agree with everything you said, and I listened to our show, and so did almost 15,000 other people at this point, that it should be about taking the person on a brand journey. And I think the mistake is everybody looks for a gimmick. Mm -hmm. And why in the gun industry is that so hard to get across to some of these owners and some of these people? Because I agree with you unequivocally. There's no argument. I think they're just hung up on things that the industry has done year over year over year for a really long time. And I'm fortunate to see it in other industries. So I think that's why I'm like, there's another way. It exists in another way. Look at other things. I don't, you feel passionate about this ambassador thing and talking about it. But in other industries, like there's just no such thing. Like I'm working with a gaming company right now, makes casino games. We don't talk about ambassadors. Yeah, I agree with it's you. It's just not no, relevant. I... It's not a thing. But the brand experience thing, you know, maybe there's a hybrid and pivoting what ambassadors are doing because if they're giving somebody, telling the story, I think we're influenced every day. Why did you buy that Kuyu shirt? There was something that connected you to it. Mm-hmm. Whatever well, it this, was. This, the CEO is okay. a friend of mine. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, all go. right, bad example. Bad <laughs> that example. Terrible. But you know what I'm saying? We're influenced all the time, but it doesn't have to be through this like flashy Instagram, Facebook. Look at me. I'm promoting this brand thing. It could just be in a conversation of mm. I stand by this brand because of X and blah, blah, blah. I agree with what you just said that the industry's hung up on the ambassador thing. But Matt and I were talking about this last night over dinner. We got deep into this. <laughs> we did. Oh, you're cheating. We you cheated. talked about it before. So today. no, <laughs> and because and, you're right. We actually have to prepare for you. Oh. But because you'll eat us alive. Yeah. But but here's the thing. We feel we were talking about this and we think that it's in a the industry is in a stage right now where it's looking for like an oracle or it's looking for like a majestic pigeon, like something to be like, oh, like this is the answer why does it not go back to your roots if trade shows if we don't think shots gonna happen the next show that happens don't you want to have meaningful connections and do real business and like 
build the relationships you need to host that other event. Why aren't we going back to the beginning when trade shows were held as a means of doing business and closing deals, not just hanging out and taking pictures for Instagram? Ooh, wee. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I feel really passionate about if shows come back, which I want them to, People should be going to them for a reason, not just because you need presence in the industry. Hey, hey that's an interesting thought, though. And, and you kind of said that before when if, if SHOT Show doesn't happen, is there a mobile showroom that goes on? Are, are people going directly to their clients across the country and moving that product around or that scene around? Yeah. And you just said, if shows come back, do shows come back? Do we need them? Do they shows see that back. one million dollars when. a year? I want to edit that out. <laughs> it's when shows come back. I need that. No, it's a good point. <laughs> do they? Do they? A lot of people are learning, not just in our industry, but uh, across the world. Maybe I can let people work from home. I don't need that yep. investment in that building. Mm -hmm. I, I can do remote. I can do this. I can cut costs here, 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 here. Does shows become collateral damage in that way? There's never not connecting face-to-face. -face. For sure. But I think, like you said, there might be replacements that come into play. Yeah. Which the we bring the event idea, to you. Right, you don't come to the event. That's the best thing I've heard so far. The Zoom meeting trade shows. Worst thing I've ever been a part I mean, of. I've been a part of one of them. So firearms is hard. People want to see it, touch right, it, feel it. Right. Not just guns, but anything. So I think there's always going to need to be some sort of physical congregation of people, yeah. whether that's one large conference or bringing it to them. I don't know. Both of those benefit me for the record. So No, listen, and that's why you're here, is that opinion. And I think that matters. And I do think... Trade shows can have a degree of success. I think that there's, listen, I, I, we talked about it earlier, like the Arnold Classic is a great show. It's a phenomenal, tr you know, but that's because Arnold, the sport, I should say Arnold Sports Festival, because oh. he's done a phenomenal job incorporating everything into it. And we talked about this a little bit last mm -hmm. night. And I think one of the failures of not just the firearms industry, of just the way it's structured, like, for example, SHOT Show, I'll pick on it for a second. The NSSF does these events upstairs. They're hardly publicized, hardly pushed out there. Nobody goes to them. No one of relevancy. We, we've talked about this, mm -hmm. Jessica. Why doesn't the NSSF sit back and say, we need to do and develop those into something that's actually meaningful, that there's a value add? Like, for example, I know, Matt, we've talked about this. We've talked about this. I would go in 30 seconds if there was a Tom Taylor, a, a this one, a that one, a, a Chucky Ware from Trijicon yeah. doing like a symposium. But the problem is they're pulling in the wrong people and they're staging the wrong events and there's just no interest. And you first have to always add value and generate interest, right? Yep. And that's what's going to draw your key executives in to say, I want to hear about this, like a private invite only if like 50 of us were invited to a symposium to talk. But our industry has always been built around everything's like a dark secret and everything's like, oh, we're not going to talk about that. And I'm a, I'm a ninja and I'm a door gunner and we're not going to discuss this and we're going to keep that quiet. And I, I take it back to you, Jessica. We'll go around the horn, but why? how do you fix that? Well, I think we've talked about how the industry's marketing teams run lean. You just said it a minute ago. You don't have the resources. If you had the resources, they should be knocking on the association's door and saying, why are we not having these? We're not going to attend the show if we're not benefiting from the offerings, not just a, a booth on the show floor, but these breakout sessions or information that's like trade show 101, 101. in any other 100%. industry is to bring people in and talk about industry oh. best practices, way to sell, way to deliver brand experiences. Like there are so many topics to cover, but I think no one's knocking on the NSSF's door going, we need to have this for this conference to be worth attending moving forward. And maybe this is that pivotal time where if it doesn't happen this year and they want to try to get people back in 2022, it's going to have to hit all these boxes to justify the spend to get there. It's, it's been the status quo. And I think mm. 18, 19 years. I mean, there's, there's guys been doing the show way longer than me, but um, mm -hmm. to a point you made earlier, um, going back when you used to do business and close deals at the show, it hasn't been like that for years. The first shot show I did was in 2013. And I remember SIG specifically having like a number they needed to hit. And I don't recall after that it being a huge focus so at least seven yeah maybe maybe six but, but the show hasn't changed i don't think it's changed with the times enough no. i don't think they made improvements mm -hmm. they, they they have but a little bit they have that supplier showcase thing or whatever yeah it's we've called. talked about yeah. that that's a little hidden gem mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's not publicized again not publicized enough not talked about enough but a bit of a hidden gem and you know 
Jonathan, I, I, I take it to you because you've been a part of a huge brand at SHOT Show, huge spend, huge influence. When you look at those breakout sessions and everything, do you, do you, like there's nothing there that gets you in the, that you're like, geez, I got to go to this. Nope. And, and to Jessica's point, before I turn it over to you, I worked in finance. I worked in all the, there was stuff I would look at on the menu when you go on some of these trips that you're like, I can't miss this. Like this is yeah. going to be cool. So-and-so speaking. I want to go see this. We don't have that. Why? Yeah, like you said, I, I, I worked with a, uh, a pretty big band, brand in the industry for, for their specific product, their niche. Uh, industry leader, right? Top of the top. And they could not, and, and it was a fight for three years for me of knocking on the door, trying to get in, trying to be the expert that they would allow us to be the expert in a breakout session. Mm -hmm. Finally, last shot show, we got to do it. But the people that were constantly being given those opportunities were the ones that had the relationships, the close friendships, or the sponsorships of that particular show. That's what buys you. Should just you be part of your package. Expertise. <laughs> you buy this, you get this, and right. now you need to provide the content. Right. It's but I mean, like like you said, John, people are giving those breakout sessions. Some of them very, very underqualified to be giving the breakout session that they're giving, purely based on spend of that show. There's just nothing that gets me excited when I look at it, mm -hmm. and and as someone who's been around the industry. You know, not as long as Matt, about as long as Jessica, both three of us, long enough that I can honestly say in seven to ten years, I have not seen anything that I'm like, I can't miss that. I mean, I criticized the NSSF for last year doing one, I believe, it was on Facebook, how to market on Facebook. I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's scary. Yeah, it's yeah, terrifying it's that that would be an angle. But we always want to be about solutions, right? And how do we create the solution? You alluded to, Jessica, a package. It should be a part of a package. Is that something in the trade show world that you're just openly discussing with them? Or how does that come off? Well, I don't deal directly with the association. I think that would have to come from, like, exhibitor level or some of the bigger brands, probably people with relationships having a conversation around, okay, you know, where there are other industries with tiers of exhibitors. So once you get to a certain tier, things come with you know, your package, whether that's the X amount of free badges, a webinar right. or a breakout session time, whatever that might be, I think they should really break it down that way so that it's giving people the opportunity because right now the opportunity doesn't exist. Or they push sponsorship, like brand these doors, put up a banner. Wouldn't it be more meaningful for me to spend $20,000 and talk to people about my product in this breakout session right. than to have a sign on a door? Probably. So I think it's them creating the structure um, to have that in place. I don't know who does that over there. <laughs> I think we all know who does it over there. The question is, you know, it comes back to will it ever change? Will there ever be that change? And is this the year that the change comes? I go to the veteran of the group. They're going to have to do something. This has been such a, a nutty year. Like you said, hey, we, we can work at home. You know, if you asked me this last year, I said, no, absolutely no way. You yeah, need to be in the office. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can't operate if we don't see each other. I, I got to walk over to your office. Right. Not a problem now. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody's remote. There's people that come in and manufacturing. You have to have certain people, right? right? But sales guys, media guys, we're all home. You know who I think could really benefit from those sessions are the people on downstairs. Because going back to when I was, mm -hmm. we were starting Q. There were a million questions I had. I came from trade shows and silencer operations over to that. Like, okay, what do I have to file with the ATF? How do I file with the, with the ATF? How do I run these sales? How do I do all of this stuff? All of these things into starting a company in this industry. Who, what's your resource? Who do you go to? Right. Who do you ask? That should be the NSSF, in my opinion. And I think everybody on that lower level are people who could either present in one or benefit from attending. And that's just, you know... Um, more another feather in their cap. The more information they're outfitted with, the better they're going to be in the industry in all aspects. Right. I think they need to look at who their customers are. Um, mm. take, a, take a look at the last five years, six years. Uh, it's super easy to start a company and make something and promote it, whether it's through social media or Amazon or eBay or you know, whatever, whatever um, uh, platform you want to choose. And it's not, it's not all about the big, big, big 
companies anymore. There's a lot of neat and cool stuff that's happening out there with smaller companies. And you're right, they don't have, they may not have the knowledge, they have the product, they have, you know, the baseline to get it out there, but how do I, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, maybe missing out on a lot of things. And I, and I think they're, they're probably looking at keeping large companies. We got to fill the space mm -hmm. because if we have people who don't show up or you're like, gosh, where's company X? They've been here for so long and they're a massive, massive gun company. Uh, it's going to send a message. I can't agree more. How we get to that place, I think, has a lot to do with the steps that we take and the things that we do as an industry that affect that change. And if shot doesn't happen, there's going to be a lot of companies that, yes, spent money on the booth but saved a lot on the ancillary stuff that comes with shot. Yep. How they voice themselves, and one of the reasons – I'm so passionate about this show is to open that dialogue that mm -hmm. really everyone's afraid to open in our industry for whatever reason. And we've all talked about this privately and that's why we're all here. You know, you go on LinkedIn and if you say like something bad, it's like, ah, like yeah. it's upset the apple. You never car. do that. And, no. no. And, and, and the funny thing is, Jessica, it's like in any other industry, you brought up ambassadors and any other industry it's okay to be like the 12th man in World War Z. Like, it's okay to be the dissenting opinion. It's okay to say, this doesn't make sense. And I went on record and I was very critical of the recoil thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, recoil came out with what I considered an obnoxious attempt at selling advertising. Okay, it was an obnoxious attempt at selling advertising. $3,500 for content you don't own to go in a place that's a closed network when I could do an ad spend and I proved it. Yeah, that would numbers. be better than this. And I'm proving it every day. And I'll give them my numbers any day of the week and twice on Sunday. But that's one of the disconnects with this industry is, oh, we have this. Don't, don't worry. We'll make a video for you and we'll put it here. And it's, it's on a closed platform. There's no net net benefit to that anymore. It's almost like we're dealing with Democrats where they don't think we have news. Like we don't think they don't yeah. think you can do any research. And Jonathan, we've talked about this. The devil's in the data, right? Yeah. And for some reason, now you had access to big spends. When you look at that stuff, tell me you're not like, you've got to be shitting me. Yeah, it's mind-blowing, especially for a closed platform, right? A, a, a paywall type platform, that type of advertising where, just like you're doing, like you, you try and put the exact spend just into your own product on that, and you're going to see better return. Way better. And own the content. Yeah. And you've produced how much content? You know what that, a spend like that looks like. Yeah. And it's insane to me. And I just don't understand it. Now, Matt, you've moved towards your own in-house spends and your own yeah. in-house development of your content. You have to look at that and say, come on. But why no one speaks up? Well, I, you have to look at the, the company, too. And to go back on an earlier point when you mentioned about SHOT Show, if you're just starting off, um, you've got limited funds. It's a good point. You know, and how you do you get out? Where's the most bang for my buck? Maybe the $3,500 for recoil because, hey, that's, my, that's part of my target my audience. Base. Maybe that's a better exposure because if you're a nobody mm -hmm. and you're very small and starting off, dump it into YouTube. No one's going to see it. At least you're, you're guaranteed some views there. Um, and, and we've gone from, you know, and we've been around since 1991 in some form and fashion. So we've been around for a long time doing different things. And we watched our, our uh, previous brand grow to be quite large. And then with the new brand, so I've seen it rise and we started right back at the beginning. And you have to be at a different stage for each level. You, you, can't, you can't take you know, this, this ungodly sum of money when you're just starting off and expect that it's the right type of marketing. Mm. And so where you are on, on certain stages will dictate how you market and where that spend goes. We had a good conversation about that last night. Jessica, it's, it's crazy to me when I see that stuff because I think, too, even to when people complain about putting money into a trade show experience. And I say to myself, at least that is you interacting with your potential mm -hmm. end user. So when I look at that, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I mean, I know you're going to play Switzerland on this, but <laughs> you're familiar with the players. It's, it's a lot of money. It's a what lot do you say to it? Money. Don't run. I'm not running. Say something. I'm playing Switzerland on it. Reframe your question. Let me ask you this. Okay. If I had $3,500 to spend in my budget, mm -hmm. 
Would that be the ideal spot? And that's the only marketing you're going to do to get your stuff out there? Yes. And you're on level one startup? Yes. I'll give you the easy softball. Okay. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I think you have to start somewhere and it has to be strategic. What are you trying to get from it? And if that is views in some Eyeballs. manner from people in the industry that feel important to you, and I would be asking Recall, who's seeing it? I want to understand who has access to this, who's paying for it, what are the, what's the demographic, who are these people? It's obviously product dependent. I don't know. If it's holsters, it's this. If it's guns, it's this. If it's military, it's that. Um, then I, I think that's okay. But if you're not asking yourself those extra 10 questions, then no. Don't just throw $3,500 at that and flush it down the toilet. Can you even produce the content they need to put on there in a meaningful way? Mm. And here's the X factor. We all know this at this table. It's not $3,500. Yeah. It's you're not going to get enough out of that. We need to do three months. Oh, for we sure. need to do six. Now you're into it for 10000 yeah. maybe even fifteen. And we all know this at this table. You could build out a hell of a, a marketing program with that type of money. Well, you and I, when we were going back and forth on the podcast, we talked about Patreon. And mm -hmm. as I started to, like, dig into that web, I was like, oh, it's kind of cool. You know, I listen to this podcast, My Favorite Murder. Mm -hmm. They give a bunch of free content on the podcast. But members who pay four bucks a month get access to a couple extra stories that you don't hear for free. Right. Maybe that's the positioning of it is we push all this free content for you, but then you have some, you know, behind the scenes stuff people have to pay to get access to. That's like an in-depth conversation with your engineers or how we came to this design, how it works, whatever the thing is. But maybe that's a way to kind of spin it, to make it worth spending. You know, you get a little bit of free stuff with it that's available to everybody, but you pay for some of that behind the scenes. I had the solution. <laughs> Of course. I did. Of course. I said it. I wrote it. So it's not a secret. I said, why I don't understand they don't go around to different shows, different podcasts, different whatever, and say, we want to host you. We're Recoil. We're big. You know, we want to host you. This is going to get to a greater question. But we want to we wanna host your content. And start hosting all this content just to gather an audience, just to build an audience. There's something to be said about that in terms of just offering the platform. Then that's going to lure people in and mm -hmm. intrigue them what's going on here. Then you can lead to the things that you're talking about, which is a paywall, mm -hmm. which leads to the greater question. I believe it's just my contention that ultimately a lot of these companies need to get to some form of whether it's a paywall or channeling on their YouTubes and on their different things to go move towards that type of omni marketing concept but the reality is companies struggle so hard to get there because matt and i and jonathan and i have talked about this and you've talked about this on air with me they do companies will produce videos about all their SKUs, then they run out of things to do now what and then it becomes mag dumps in a desert and that's how they sell products so the question becomes what do companies do in step one, as we talked about, you're at level one. What do they do at level two? What do they do at level three? And how do they get from that point? Because we've talked about this at length, all of us individually. Companies struggle at different moments in their growth cycle to get past, to blow past. Maybe it's a CEO that doesn't realize he's in over his head. Maybe it's a marketing director that doesn't really understand the different channels or the things that they can be doing something as simple that i've talked about which is you go to some of these shows they don't even stream when they have like don jr and kimberly speaking as like the guest like it makes no sense to me it makes no sense to me you could do that with a cell phone yeah and a tripod and a tripod <laughs> and they don't do it so we're all supposed to be supposed experts in our field. What suggestions do you give at step one versus step three? And how do you build out and get to that point? And what's the roadblock and what's preventing a lot of that? So touching on what you yeah. just said about uh, Don Trump and Kimberly being in the booth and not streaming it, right? Building out, going back to this ambassador program, influencer, affiliate, whatever you want to call it, building out those relationships and actually making a program work very few companies then spend the dime to create quality content for them. Fly them out, fly you and a videographer out and go get a great hype commercial of you and this ambassador and your product using it. 100%. You just ship them a product and, and hope and they do some stuff. Yeah. 
and and I think that's where some steps are being missed because once you build that important vital relationship, tie the tie the two together, and go finalize that process and get get the content, make that investment to get quality content out of it, not just Instagram story after Instagram story because that's very short lived. Hundred percent. You you got to have the relationships. Yeah, you absolutely. It's it's critical, but at 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 level one as a startup, and, and we've kind of been there for us, it's, it's hard. So what do you do to make yourself stand out? How do you get in this market? And the market from 10 years ago isn't the same market we're in now. Yeah. You know, I'd say even a couple of years ago, it's a very different market. So it's ever changing and for building sure. a brand is hard. Um, you know, I, I take it as it's my own money. I don't own the company, but I treat it as mine. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of screwing up. There's a lot of, you're like, Man, that sucked. That was a terrible idea. You get um, nine wrong. I think that's okay. Yeah. I would rather hear a company say, uh, we screwed up and did something wrong than oh, yeah. just look the other way. And but but you it have off to. The internet. You have to. It's, it's not an easy process. And it's uh, sometimes, like I said, it's a slow burn. And you got you to gotta figure out what works and what doesn't for your customer. Mm-hmm. And then once you get that customer, how do you keep that customer? Right. I think going back to just creating content, mm-hmm. content relevancy if you're putting out things that are mag dumps, then you're not in touch with who your customer is and what they need from you. And I'm sure if you open up your Instagram DMs for six hours, you can make a list of questions on things people are asking over and over and over again that have not been answered. They can't find the answer on your website. They can't find it in any of your videos. That's where your content generation should be, where Amen. the frequently asked questions, what are your customers telling you? I don't have this information. I can't find it anywhere. Or you're being asked over and over again. Build content that way. And sometimes I think, you know, maybe you filmed a video in 2013 on this subject matter and people still have questions. You got to redo that stuff to keep it. It's 2020. If I go on YouTube and I search for something, I'm like, this video is from 2013. (laughs) I'm not watching it. I'm not watching it. I want the latest, greatest information. Refresh that stuff. So people should have content calendars, social media calendars. Map out a plan for a year. Even if you have to change it 100 times, at least it's a target of the type of content and what content you want to get out there. Yeah, and, and content creation, y- you can't rely on ambassadors anymore as mm-hmm. your soul. You're, you're like, well, that's not what I wanted. That's not what, you can't ship a product out and go, okay, we'll make a video for me and we're going to post it. Yeah, that's a you gotta, in the Yeah, you got to bring it inside. It's authentic, and, but it can be scary. It can be. <laughs> it's terrifying. It actually yeah. can be. No, it's terrifying. And, and that's a process that a lot of companies revert to. And we've seen it a hundred times you know, I know very closely over the years, Matt, Jonathan, we've, we've seen it so much that it's actually, it's terrifying the amount of times we've seen it. I mean, the amount, I say it all the time, the amount of product companies are willing to send out blindly mm-hmm. is positively terrifying. And we've seen it 150 times. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with product and giving product to the right people. Yeah, but absolutely not. I remember even when we started working together really heavy, Matt, we, we, we kind of talked about it and the amount of, that you were sending out and what was going on, and, and we, we thought about cutting that back, and that was kind of the genesis of beginning some of the talks of doing an in-house event and things like that. And you have to, and I think that's, if we're talking about going from step one to step two, you have to get your product out there. So that's step one. You have to get it in people's hands. You have to get people talking about it. And that's, you know, that's a part of the life cycle of building a brand. And you just, people, it has to be in people's hands at the end of the day. But when you're going to step two, which is trying to grow that brand beyond and start to turn customers or people that give, you've given gifts to into clients, into long, at some point you have to turn the spigot off and you have to say, okay, now it's time to build a brand. You know, mm-hmm. Now it's time to build a message. And now it's time to start to generate actual real buzz around what we're trying to do here. And I've said it for years about a brand like Vortex. It's where they're going and what they're trying to do that's exciting. And that's one of the things that, that excites me about that brand. I remember when I first got in the business, people were like, you're crazy. And we remember this, Matt. You're cra- they're like a Hyundai. Are you out of your mind? You are crazy. Yeah, you're crazy. That's true. But <laughs> at the same time, there's not a lot of people laughing now at that brand. 
because it's literally become a tidal wave yeah. that's taken over the industry. Now, you've gone from big brands, Jonathan, to small brands, and you've worked with all kinds, similar to me, over the years, and you've seen it from both sides of the spectrum, as Jessica has. When you see it from both sides of the spectrum and you don't have those spends, you have to be very judicious about where you park your time, your money, and where you put things. And I think that companies make a very, very critical mistake of trying to get a little bit into an area without fully understanding that area. And that's where the key of consultants and bringing the right people in to gain their knowledge and their understanding. It's like saying, we only have 50 grand, we can't do a trade show booth. Well, you don't know that, like we've talked yeah. about, you don't know that. So I ask you, Jonathan, when you're looking at step one to step two, what's the trigger that starts to begin that transition to, we gotta stop giving free shit away and we have to start thinking about how we're gonna build a brand here and what do those steps look like? Yeah, I mean, like Matt said, it's it's an investment, and, and you look at it as your own money. Um, I mean, it's your budget for that year, you know. So as you're looking at your spend, and as, as you're giving away product to influential people that can propel your brand into the, you know, people's hands that are going to buy it, ranges are going to see it. Uh, inf influential people are are using your product. That next step in turning them into clients, their audience into clients, is it's kind of solidifying that relationship. We're talking about building the relationship with those people that you're giving the gifts to at first, you're giving the product to. Once that relationship solidified and you get the content out there and you start to, uh, like Matt said, you're tweaking things, you're, you're running through this, that, and the other until you become more effective and more efficient. And uh, one, of the, one of the curveballs to throw in there is relationships are not um, property of the company. Mm. right who builds those relationships are you willing to invest in your employees that's right that are mm. that are worth it because as soon as that guy's gone your relationship is not there anymore they call them in the finance industry rainmakers okay and in the finance industry they're highly respected you have guys that sit in offices in huntington ave and in boston we're all from new england except for you but <laughs> we won't hold it against you but those guys are considered like the oracles because they bring the business in. They don't necessarily know how to close it all the time, but they bring the people in. I worked with a few of those guys. I understand those guys. I modeled a lot of what I do by those guys. And in our industry, they're cast away like fucking dumpster rags. And they're not respected enough. And I'm, I think grossly misunderstood. And I think companies do look around and say like, oh, now, now, now what? We lost... Jonathan or John or Matt, I, what, what, what do we do now? Because they don't understand where a rainmaker fits yeah. and where that plays into because they're constantly obsessed with a term I want to get to and I want to go around the table about, which is ROI, which is the most misfucking construed word by companies ever in the history of business. People have looked at you, Jessica, and said, what's my ROI on this booth? Well, uh that is the most bastardized word in the in the firearms industry. Our answer, working on this side now, it's never just the dollar. It's always about how many people, you know, we plan to impact with this or how many impressions you're going to make or how many, on the virtual side, it's literally how many times someone clicked this video, how right, many times this right. person visited a room, how many... There's a lot more information that I think um, marketers need to turn into dollar signs on their end to justify what the spend is. Um, but I think in this industry, it's often the dollar amount. Mm -hmm. What do I get in return for this? And, and I'm sure the true definition of marketing somewhere tells you that it's not always, you know, a check or money just passed over. It's influencing people, giving them a brand experience, building which, customers. Which, which those things that you just listed doesn't happen after one time. Nope. You know, like mm -hmm. that's, Close. that's a multi-year decade investment mm -hmm. Of, of hitting the same people with the same brand experience until that's what they think of. Every time they think of your brand, every time they think of yep. your company, they think of that time they went through your SHOT Show booth and it just felt like, I mean, you you, you had the inch-thick memory foam pad. <laughs> you walked through that booth <laughs> yeah. and like, oh. I'm in heaven. Yeah. Like, yep. I'm in heaven. Yeah. It, it's about getting that customer and, and mm -hmm. having them believe in your brand and want to be a part of your brand. Like, man, that's a place I might want to work. I really like what they do. And giving them that experience. And I think the customer experience is the next level. And there's some companies that get it incredibly right. You look at companies like Gunworks. 
You look at what they're doing. You look at some brands that build around the customer experience. And I've talked about this. There's so many retailers out there that when I consult with retailers, I ask the question, do you have a list of everybody that's spent, let's pick a marquee number, Mm $5,000 with you a year, a widget? And they're like, what do you mean? That, that's like crazy to them, right? Like, well, do you have a list? Because you should probably consider reaching out to them at certain times in the year, maybe having specific sales that cater to that crowd, to those people that are making multiple spends with you over time and understanding that that's like somebody you want to continue to spend. You want them to continue to become more of a client and understand that experience. These are all things that go on, as Jessica said, in every other industry. So you bang your head against the wall. You, they almost look at you like you're crazy, right? I get the crazy all the time. But I'm like, this is stuff that's done in every other business. And why is it so crazy to wrap your head around in this business and understand? There's not a retailer that I've come across yet. I challenge every retailer out there to show me that has any type of structure to that type of program that I've seen. And you all can prove me wrong and tell me otherwise. You've all worked for a lot of retailers. I haven't seen one yet that has a scenario like that. Yeah, and it's super important. I mean, the segmenting your audiences mm-hmm. so that you can market specifically for each type of customer you have. And even if that's a customer that has $5,000 a year spend with you to $20,000 a year spend, they should have different promotions sent at them, different key marketing campaigns uh, to get that going. And I do, I think that I think that's a big miss overall Huge. in the industry. Um, but the people that are doing it right are doing it right. But who's doing it right? It's a million dollar question. Who's got the right model? No one else will know how you answer. Just say the names. (laughs) I'll look into it. Don't tease me. (laughs) But Jessica, what do you, when you look out there and and we're talking about segmenting and we're talking about building what we would call a client list, really, why is that such a failure with so many brands? I didn't realize it was. I mean, we've talked about it before, but for you not to have a a report that's run all the time just to understand who's spending money with you seems crazy to me. Of course you want to know who your key customers are so that you can show them extra love or whatever it is. I've had two conversations over and over again with multiple players in the industry, and I've asked that question, and the other question I've asked is a simple one, and you've heard me say it. What's your content creation strategy? And they look at me like I'm fucking crazy. So they're not strategically targeting anything. They're just latching on what other people are doing and Shopping hoping it works. Us. It's <laughs> spray and pray. So I'll give a shout out to, uh, to David over at Taurus. Okay. David's a good example. A year and a half ago, David came to me and said, hey, I'm putting together a range bag for all of my ranges that are the, the top sellers. We like David. Top pushers, okay? And so David came and, and we did a custom paper target for him. Taurus branded everywhere. I chipped in to pay for the target, so we we co-branded it, right? And then I get my brand in front of all those, all of his key customers, mm-hmm. and then he's shipping this range bag with paper targets, a little bit of this, that, holsters. You know, he shipped a nice VIP range I've seen bag mm-hmm. to each one of his ranges that were his top guys, and, and that is the type of segmented advertising that should be happening more frequently. But I like that. A hundred percent. I guess I, when you asked the question, I just went back to like my days at SIG and everything was very segmented. What commercial saw, Mill mill didn't see. What Mill saw, LE didn't see. And LE didn't see what Global saw. We just, they had their each, you know, segmented little marketing groups that we worked with and they were never overlapping. The only time you see them together is shot. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they have their own targeted events, their own targeted customers. and, And the marketing was always different the campaign looked the same, you know, if this year we weren't showing people's heads or or whatever it was, it was sexy product shots that carried through, but otherwise it was very specific and targeted, but obviously I work for a big brand. So yeah, sick being the monster in the room. So, (laughs) so that's a one, (laughs) that's a one in a million. Now how we want to offer solutions, you know, how do you, I think Jonathan alluded to like, you know, a start, a genesis of a program that could be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what companies need to look at is where's the genesis? Well, it's being from a smaller brand, it's hard to do it all on your own. Mm. And and Jonathan has a good point. Um, If you can kind of help piggyback or find a complementary company to work with and say, look, these two things go together. 
and and we all kind of have the same customer base, and that that may create a new customer. It's like, wow, these guys are these guys are tight. This was this was great. And you want to feel good about that brand, but it's it's sometimes it's just difficult to do it. So finding somebody else that again relationships right yeah, that you can work well with and you feel good about that company I'm like yeah i know this guy we were on a podcast together and you know we talked and we're nine months down the road and you know whatever it may be mm. um this is this is such a long game of of sales and marketing and, and how to build a brand and how to get it there it does not happen overnight yeah it's if, if, if relationships don't lead to collaboration you're doing it wrong yeah, it should be okay to pick up the phone and say, yeah. hey, XYZ customer, what do you think of this? And if they're like, you're absolutely nuts, I'd never buy that, move on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe well, ask three. Yeah, we always have an, uh, an am I crazy litmus test that we run amongst us. You, Jonathan's <laughs> laughing because I do this all the time. I'm oh, like, uh, he's laughing because I, I, I will pick up the phone. I'll call people like Matt. I'll call people like, and I'll say, am I fucking crazy? Oh, I thought you only posted on LinkedIn. No, this. Uh, listen, That's where I see them. Let me give everybody. That's post conversation. Let me give, let <laughs> me give everybody something valid. for the record. The LinkedIn stuff. A lot of research goes into that before. There's a lot <laughs> of conversations. Sure. And there's, there's three AM posts. And there's LinkedIn. not. And there's it's kind not, of emotional. I think there's not a lot of people <laughs> that I don't consult with before. And there's more than one person <laughs> happy when it happens. Okay, uh. because I feel and have felt that the industry is lacking that that point of view because it would clean some of the bullshit up and I think some of it does need to be cleaned up and I know as friends you guys get on my case sometimes about it but I think we're all in agreement that it does some of it needs to be put in check because it will get out of control I don't disagree I support most of the things that you're champion championing championing I can't even talk um the most of the things that you're putting out I agree with I always say it's your delivery so no, it's how you get the point across that You're might such a be homer. rumbling people's feathers. But I do think uh, the industry needs to start pivoting and, and oh. looking, looking to some change. It, it needs putting, an enema. Putting on I've new, said it before. Yeah, an enema. It really does. <laughs> no, you've said that a lot, Matt. And I think that's part of the reason why you're here. I think it does need a flux whatever that looks like, some type of flux. But I think the problem is it looks for an oracle for that to happen. It doesn't need to be an oracle. It just needs to be someone and people willing to have a conversation like this, willing to have dialogue. And this is what the this is exactly what we're doing here is what should be happening in those NSSF rooms. Because I think a lot of people would tune in and I think a lot of people would come and watch if you had key executives, people, players, marketing symposiums, things like that. And it wasn't the same three, four, six people. Jonathan, you and I have passed around things that they've put up. It's not a secret. Yeah. So don't fucking hide. We've passed around <laughs> things that they've, they've, they've put. And it's insane to me, the people that they put in those rooms to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I mean, a lot of the... A lot of the like I said before, a lot of the experts that are being put out there as, as leaders in the industry might be a small player in their niche but because of either that relationship or that sponsorship spend mm -hmm. that year. They get propelled as this, uh, as this leader, uh, industry leader, and it's, it's bogus. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to are they forging into areas that they understand fully? Have they developed any new mediums or have they, you know, shown a path to anything? And I, I think the answer is no. But, but beyond all that, I think people want to hear from, you know, you brought up Jessica like Sig, for example, and I, I, I know you have a history with them, but they, they've done a lot of things right. They've done a lot of things wrong, but they're very open to having those conversations about things that they do. Why they're not in a symposium having discussions, why some of those players, like I look at out there across the spectrum, there's so many great optics companies that have risen up over the years. I'd love to hear from some of those people. And that's the stuff that needs to happen. And, and you know, I think understanding the brand journey, which is something that you've talked about, is what would help a lot of those people on that bottom level. Oh, strategically targeting your customers could be one whole session. Mm -hmm. um, or more. I'll, I'll go back to what I'm working on right now. Some of their breakout sessions are, not that you guys are into gaming, but they're having the I people am. who design the games and the engineers host these designer panels. It's a live webinar online that people can engage and talk to them. Think of how many engineers in the industry would love to be talking to some top engineer just to understand their thought process, how they look at things. 
how they came to fruition with a product or whatever it was, those types of things I think people would really geek out on and benefit from. And then if you're the exhibitor or the brand, if I'm SIG and I send four engineers to staff my exhibit, but they're also getting educated there and like doing things that are meaningful and they can take back with them, then it's worth me putting them up in a hotel and getting them on an airplane and going to this thing not just standing around and eating the snacks and pretending to talk to people and give them the brand experience mm. that they're probably not. Now, Matt, you've been in this business a long time. You've built a brand from dirt. I'm going to say things you won't. I'm going <laughs> to pat you on the back. You've built a brand from dirt. That light space, when you got in, everybody thought you were crazy. It's crowded. You're out of your mind. You've carved out a niche. You're a guy I would love to see do a talk, a Q&A, something. Have they ever come to you? Nope. Nope. Would you do it if they did? I probably would. Uh, I think I have some, uh, some unique experiences I can share. And like you said, there's a lot of people going, what the hell to do? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. what, what is this? How did this happen? What do you do when... when you, you get this sort of problem, and, and as, as startups and new companies, you all face a lot of the same issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's most people's experiences are going to be the same when you're doing a startup, and I don't care what industry it's in. Yep, agreed. The question is the why. You know, why that, that those, those walls are not being broken down? I think this industry, from, from what I've been able to see over, uh, you know, my time, um, it's still a little walled off, and it's still a little closed, and sometimes if you're not part of, um, you know, maybe one of the bigger brands, you, you get kind of left behind. Um, I think this industry is very difficult to, to grow and become a, a, a big player in. Mm. Change is scary. Risk. Risk is scary. Yeah. And there's a lot of just fat, dumb, and happy. And mm. they don't want it to change. <laughs> and they're like, don't change anything, you know, yeah. well, show, that's, that's stay the I, same. That's what I was going to say is, is the, the barrier, why it hasn't changed. A lot of the company's executive level employees are still in that old mentality. They, they've been and there far too long. That's coming around, but they've been there for a long time. And until that change is over, the person that handles the money that makes the decision it's is, most powerful person in the room. Mindset. Yeah. Now, I had Brittany May on, and she alluded to this, and, and I think, Jessica, we kind of touched on it. But there's a lot of people that end up at these companies, these brands, these, whether it's the NSSF or the NRA, and they're just a nice, but he's a nice guy. <laughs> there's a lot of nice guy hires, and there's a lot of people that, are, but they're a nice guy. And you come across that a lot in this industry. I've literally been on the phone with key executives, which Jonathan's alluding to, and they say things like, ah, you know, I just, I got a couple years left. I'm just trying to get Susie through college. And, <laughs> and they stymie any growth and cut off and choke off any potential. And it's insanely frustrating because those are the companies and the people that you're alluding to, the leading players that you need to rise up to be like, no, we got to do this. What are you doing? But I feel like there's, sometimes I feel like I'm the only person in the room like, no, this doesn't make any, this makes no sense. (sighs) And it's one of the reasons I started the show. So the question to you, Jessica, because I I look at you as the resident genius when it comes to translating this because if trade shows are going to continue and they're going to and they're going to still happen and these fan experiences or these these uh, uh dealer experiences are going to continue to happen you have to draw in the people that are willing to spend the money and get the boots so it has to change i agree i think there's a balance in every company's you know employee makeup or ecosystem of employees sometimes you need the ones that are all bulldogs and charging forward and there's a place for them Sometimes you need the nice guys to keep things on an even keel and have that balance there, but it's where you're strategically placing them and playing on strengths and weaknesses that you have to consider. So if your goal is to sell, then you're going to need the Bulldogs to be charging forward and, you know, even when they hit a wall, they just keep going and plowing through. And, you know, the nice, the nice people, well, there are roles for them, but I don't think it's uh, mm. in hitting those goals. So I want to ask... I'm going to go around the horn with this. We talked about 
the steps, one getting from one to three, but what are some of the, when you look across the spectrum, there's so many incredible brand failures or mistakes. And I feel like we can learn from all these mistakes. We can get better, but we get incredibly trapped. And we were talking about this at length offline and we've all talked about this. I, I felt for a long time, one of the traps has been the industry's trapped in, we've just convinced all these executives, all the gray hair in the room that Instagram is a thing. And now they're trapped. They can't get beyond Instagram, right? So when you mention- new to them. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's new to them. So when you mention like TikTok, that may as well be like this crazy <laughs> far off land, like, whoa. And when we mention YouTube, they still haven't cracked that code. There's not a company that's cracked that code. And Jessica, you're the resident client experience person. Why is, what is it about that that they just can't crack that code? To me, YouTube is entertainment. Do your SKU videos and then there should be entertainment there. But what is it about, why is, maybe it's not YouTube, pick anything. But why can't they crack that code of like, hey, we have to think beyond. I don't know, why, guy, why can't you guys crack the code? <laughs> I think they can. It's just, it's their, their help. Jonathan will get into why he's held back. I think they're looking at a marketing book that they like wipe dust off every time yep. that they go to do something. And they're like, what does it say about video in here? VHS? Oh, we'll do that. <laughs> That's where I think it is. Like so I, they're I, not staying current with what's. Yeah, part of, part of the problem that, that a lot of companies may experience is you got to have everyone on board. And you you got to convince your CEO or your owner, or your president, or whomever, top down. Everyone's got to be on the on the on the same page and be like, yes, this is the same consistent message we want to deliver. This is this is who we are. Um, and I think if you don't have that, it can create some problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. If and you're not sharing that same goal, like this is where we want to drive to, and this is how we're going to do it. And if you don't start taking care of the customer mm -hmm. and putting the customer first. You know, and reaching out and giving them that sort of omni experience, whether, you know, it's, it's one thing to have a Facebook page and a YouTube page and, a, and an Instagram and put, put it out there and say, hey, this is where we are. Yep. But it's another to say, hey, customer, we really want to take care of you. We want to bring you in and we want you to, to feel like you're a part of our family. I have a point on this. Something else I'm working on because it's mm. outside the industry. So I'm here with the ideas today. I love it. Customer tells us they, they sent out a survey to their customers. They asked all types of questions. And the feedback they got was, we don't know who your brand is anymore. You have new leadership. Mm. We have no idea what you're doing in, a lot of with that, product. Yeah. We have no idea what's going on. Who are you and what's your brand? Well, there are big shows not happening now. So the first video that they're creating for this uh, virtual event mm -hmm. is a State of the Union address. Here is what we're doing, who we are, who we... We've listened to you. We want to give you this information. Here's how we're, you know, kind of reorging internally to deliver better. They're even saying, we screwed up. We've screwed up on invoicing you. We haven't been shipping product on time. We've blah, blah, blah. Not in these words, but they're taking everything that they've heard and saying, we heard you and yeah, we're, we're going to be better. Yeah. And this is our strategic plan. And this is all just in one 30 minute video address that it'll there's, be live once and then posted forever. There's zero chance of seeing that anytime soon in the firearms. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Well, I'm just telling you. I'll, I'll put it, it back on all of you. <laughs> tell me another CEO in the firearms industry that was as public as I was, or was as present as I was, or was as out there as I was besides maybe Kevin. So you can relate. <laughs> well, I know different story. I don't want to go there, but but I'm saying these leaders are petrified to put themselves out there. Well, it can petrified. It doesn't have to be like everything's on the table, but it just acknowledging, I think, is yeah. peace of mind. Jessica, for the tell me another CEO you've seen actually do a video. I got an example. It wasn't a video. It wasn't <laughs> a video, but Taurus's <laughs> new CEO, he, uh, similar to, to what you were talking about, sent a letter out. A um, couple months after he came in, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. And, and it's happening. But talk to his retailers, talk to his dealers, his ranges, his customer base. Introduced him, told him what they were fixing, and and I got that email. I was subscribed to the email list, and um, it's that was really impressive. But but coming back to to the dust on the marketing book, um, I'm amazed, and I I, I don't like to uh, to call out brands, but. Do it. I am amazed at how long Ruger and Smith and Wesson, from a marketing standpoint, just 
just cruise controlled off the brand they built two decades ago. Totally coasting. Their digital marketing three, four years ago, I mean, the last year it started to pick up. They've started to catch on a decade late. <laughs> but cruise control from 90s marketing with no, no care whatsoever, the digital space, based on the brand that they built two decades ago. And, and that's amazed me because that, you're talking about like, what, top five, top seven gun brands. Well, let's see if that lasts. Mm. All these new gun owners during this time are young right. people that right. are in the digital age. They're, mm -hmm. you know, these young 20-something-year-olds who do rely on that type of thing. So will they be running to Ruger, exactly. Smith & Wesson? Exactly. I don't know. I don't know and, that and, it's not being pushed on them. And like you said, Matt, like, the crowd coming up right now, the new generation of gun owners, they want to be a part of a brand. They want to they see do. your brand yeah. and be a part of that brand. It's not just a product. It's not whether the product works or not works anymore. It's because of the brand that you put out there. And some of the companies that I think of when I think of, of doing it right, there's holster companies up the wazoo. Uh, Trex Arms, he, he just has built a brand around him, mm -hmm. around him. Lucas has built that brand, and, and that makes people want to – Buy that product, have that product. Tier one conceal. Jared, the owner, same thing. He's a wicked fast shooter, crazy good shooter. He's got the relationships to collaborate. And, nice guy, and, too. Yeah, he's a great guy. And people want to shoot like Jared, and they know they're never going to, but they but buy that product. That's part of, of the that. brand and yeah, the experience. And be like, hey, I want to. I want to be that guy on the weekend or I want to be that mm -hmm. girl on the weekend. And that's, that's what I want to do. I may not ever get there. I may not be right. that, that pro shooter or professional shooter or, or be that fast or own the same guns, but you know, it's something I want to, I want to go out and do on the weekend. And I'll say again to SIG's credit, SIG in the last year has used their competitive shooters in a way that they never have before. Mm -hmm. They've publicized them a lot more. They've thrown Smart. Max out there. Lane is teaching Shout classes out to Daniel Horner. Academy. Mm -hmm. I love Daniel. And Max. Daniel, too. Max is teaching classes at the academy. You know, they're up there for a week every year teaching courses. And, and that cross between, uh, I mean, even three years ago, having a competitive shooter teach a tactical course of students was, was not okay. And, and that bridge is coming together. And, and it was like Moses parting the sea. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, yeah. But. Yeah, go the ahead, younger go ahead. generation is they definitely going to be that. Want I want to go to the academy. I want mm. that one on one time. I want. I want to be able to say that I shot or I was trained by blah. Yeah, yeah. it, it comes. It comes down to taking a page from any other industry. After every football game, Bill Belichick gets up there and does a press conference, and you hear from Robert Kraft. After you know, when GE was in charge, you thought of Jack Welch immediately. Okay, in our industry, for whatever reason, these CEOs they're running, they're hiding, they're ducking. <laughs> They're in the weeds. They're scared to death to be out there. So to, to your point, I, don't, I see it happening in pockets, Jonathan, because you get a little bit of that aging out, but they are scared to death. Terrified to All be right, out there. Craft the message and let your PR people say it, right. but the message should be out there that Agreed. you're behind this and, and we're going to be better, different, whatever it is. We have a plan. Just we have even a plan. During, Just say that. We have a even plan. Even during this pandemic, I put it to you, Jessica and, and Matt, I don't know. I can't think of one CEO that came out with some type of messaging. I, I don't think I've ever seen. Did they need one during all of Well, this? I think it would be, I mean, but now's <laughs> yeah. a good time. Well, you know? I, I pushed last time. I said they should be focused on education, 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 education. We want you know, gun owners that are going to be safe out there. We're promoting this. We're, we're putting all that out. In, in, I didn't see any of that. And Smith & Wesson is doing a little bit. I saw with... with They've started some educational which, videos with Julie. Yep. They're doing better, right? They're, they're, they're understanding picking it up. the shift. But I think it comes from the top, and I challenge them. I always challenge leadership. Leadership, it's okay to come out with, like you said, like something that's like, hey, this is what we're doing. A letter from the top, or like you said, crafting it. Why the reluctance? I have theories, but because I think it all running a company is not easy. I'll just throw that out there. Well, I know you know that. And I know everyone, you know, but here's the thing. When you're trying to lead from the top down, it starts at the top. Oh, yeah. Shit rolls downhill. It rolls downhill. <laughs> and I think now is a great time to claim that spot. 
And I had, um, I'm going to call him, I, I had Ryan McMillan here from Graybo. We had a long conversation. He did the show. He stuck around for about two hours after. Shout out to Graybo. And Ryan and I talked. And I said, the industry is craving a leader like you. Former Navy SEAL, heir to the McMillan throne, whatever that looks like, but still that name. And if you can get out there and you can just speak and talk and be a leader that the industry needs, you have all the boxes checked that this industry craves for whatever right reason or wrong reason. It craves that. Why the reluctance from leadership to step up and say something, anything, do they need to? Mm, we can debate that. But I think if SHOT Show doesn't happen, they absolutely need to if they ever needed to. What do you say to that? I don't know. So I, I, um, I go back to the dust off the, the marketing book. but uh, Throw it out. <laughs> throw, out the throw the fucking book out. I mean, well, go ahead. Say what you're going to say. You made me forget. Well, it's <laughs> the like, space has changed. Uh, our customers are different now. And, and if you're not embracing that digital space, and I think there's a bit of a fear from maybe... Maybe there's an age thing. Maybe the people run the, the larger ones and they don't get it. And like, oh, well, my kids, you know, my kids have a, you know, TikTok or, or whatever it may be. Pick your platform. Um, and it might be a little scary to them and say, well, what do you mean? I got to I got to do this. I've, I've been doing this for so long and look how big we are. Look how successful we are. Uh, and they're, they're afraid to jump into that digital space and say, hey, it's worked for this long. Why do we have to change it? My, my former company. Uh, there's probably one to two people in that building, big company, one to two people that follow any pages on social media, gun related, industry related, like they're that removed. And then bring it back to the, the, I remember now the dust off the book. In this pandemic time, the companies that are struggling, anytime there's a downturn, right? Election year, whatever you want to call it. What's the first department that they look at to cut? Marketing. Marketing. Marketing, so Should so dumping if, dollars if, into it. Exactly. If you're looking at your priority list of what's important, that obviously means marketing falls at the bottom for those companies that are going to look to marketing first. That means marketing falls at the bottom, and that is is a reflection on leadership, CEO, whoever you want to call it. But that's that's when you gain the market share. That's when you you don't cut marketing in that type. No. Well, if you're small in the industry and you cut marketing, now you have zero Nothing. presence. Nothing. Now you're on hope and a prayer. I hope they still remember us through right. this entire thing. And That's not reality. And you go back to the relationships not being a property owned by a company. Yep. Right? Like it, it, in, a, in a little downturn time, if you look to move that, that person that's been working to build those relationships for you, it doesn't just transfer over to the next guy. Not, not to the new guy. Three like, months, yeah. You know, like. Yeah. It goes with him. All that right. investment you put into that, you, you Oof, then you're going to start from terrifying. square one four months later, and then that's why we're always a decade behind. And mm -hmm. I want to go to cost because we talk about, you said, you know, people think they can't do a trade show exhibit for X dollars. People think that they can't do digital for X dollars. Right. And it's a big topic. If you're, to your point, if you're like, oh, it's an age gap thing. If you're an older person and the fear of the unknown is just, you know, I don't understand social media. I'm old. I need a young person. Just saying, I know I need a young person to do it is the yeah. first step. The second step is to acknowledge that these kids in college right now or high school know how to do all the shit for this much money. Right. They just need an entry-level job, and they will film and edit any video for you on their iPhone, and it'll be quality content don't that we used to pay $100,000 for. You know the guy I'm referring to because it's your guy, but it's pennies right now to make videos, create content, have them edited, put in words or text or, you know, the little snips I'll say you do. It. it costs nothing. I crank, out, nothing. I crank out more content by accident. Yeah. Than any of these, than any of these top companies out there right now, and I challenge them because they'll lose every time because you know what my spend is on that. Yeah. So I'll say it right in front of the camera. I'll challenge them. I, I fucking dare them. If you, you everybody's probably going to be uh, coming into a lot of money soon as the orders are continuing to ship. Hire some kid for thirty grand and just let him. Thirty, out they'll do for you. naked cartwheels. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> whatever. A good one who will pump some stuff out for you. But it's it's. Well, and this is, I want you to stay on this because this is an important one. 
Jessica, how, what advice would you give to brands coming out of SHOT Show, whatever that looks like? Because SHOT Show is going to create a domino effect because you have SCI right after followed by GAO. I know that's yeah. the elephant in the room yeah, no one wants to talk ugly. about. You have a domino mm-hmm. effect. A so GAO let's say they all go oh. away and there's X amount of dollars. What would you do with that money and how do these companies get over the top? Oh my God. Live stream some new product launches, create a video series, do all this. Live, content, that's China. Get a whole no. bunch of stuff going, <laughs> go on tour, take the events to people. There's a million things. SHOT Show shouldn't be the end all be all of marketing. Like you're just not going to market your product because the show's canceled. No, I don't think that's reality. And if you're still thinking like that in 2021, then you probably won't exist much longer beyond all of this. You have to get in front of people and keep your brand relevant right now. They can't go to the store and see a touch of feel it. And the digital space is just getting more competitive right now because there's not that face-to-face interaction. And so your ad spends up and, and you're converting at a lower rate and all that stuff sucks. <laughs> like you've got to get some type yeah. of person-to-person yeah. event back so that uh, at least it can ease up the competitiveness on yeah there's a certain segment of the business that requires that it's still on a handshake or you know eye contact whatever it is i'll I'll say exactly what i suggested to someone same thing right dovetailing off what you said scott volkortson called me said what do you think sponsors the show i said scott i wouldn't invest a dime into shot show i would take that money and i would invest it into doing your own event right near your headquarters take people to the range put something together for 20 30 grand immediately Fly in your best dealers, your best vendors, let them shoot your guns, let them hang out. Mm, Bring yeah. out a handful of influencers, people you work closely with, you know, Colby, Cheyenne, a few people you work with, and make a thing out of it. Take yeah. everybody to dinner, wine and dine them. It'll be the best 30 grand spend and do, you know, a, a, a deal for your dealers while you're there. So you do a deal, yep. you know, while you're there. But don't sit and do cold. But now, it, he's progressive, so he's willing to hear it. It's the same... It's not just for closing deals, though, either. You could do that for the media and bloggers. We did it at Q in the beginning where we were not ready to put all of the product out there just yet, but we still wanted to drum some buzz up about it. So we flew a bunch of bloggers out to Kevin's farm and they filmed stuff there and took pictures there and they got the first real sneak peek and then agreed to just pump it out pre-shot show before we were ready to show it. So if you're saying, I don't want to bring, you know, um, more marketing people internal or digital, then bring the media people to you right. give them this all expenses paid little thing yeah. provide them with the good food the texas barbecue yeah and Ooh. you are creating a brand experience and influencing them right it's, there You'd it's be all surprised. about the experience it yeah. totally is yeah yeah and shout out to uh, springfield armory because i was a part of a few of their launch events and they would do a writer's event for every product i hope they're yeah. paying you and <laughs> 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 they would do a writer's event for every product they'd fly everybody out to vegas put them up in the Paris Hotel, good experience. Everybody was in suites, and then they're on the range for a day. They're in the classroom for a couple hours, teaching them ever b- about about the product, all the details, all the specs, and then they're on the range with a production crew making videos of all these people using their stuff. And this is three months before launch, you know, four months before launch. Yeah. Right. And so they have all that prep for launch day, and and then now even what with what they did with the Hellcat shipping that, that was just simply shipping it out the hellcat campaign was smart but it was a step shipped, in the right direction they had to have shipped 1500 guns out Oof. like that was everywhere in think, other industries they do it right, <laughs> we're catching right, up we're catching right, up right, right, right. <laughs> so matt what do you say to what the next step would be post lack of shot lack of sci lack of you know to jessica's point what would you suggest the first step would be to someone, if someone picked up the phone and said, what are, you, what are we going to do? I think it depends on the size of your company and where you're at. I mean, you know, obviously, we can't do what, what Springfield did. Right. Uh, but what, what Q did and, and the show that we did before, yeah, you, you absolutely could. Scale. Yeah, you, you just scale it down. And, and I think that's, that's probably the most effective thing you can do. And bring it in-house. Bring, bring your content in-house and stop relying on everybody else with, with the, the quality of an iPhone video and the frequency you can put stuff out and just 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 be yourself don't 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 try and get like this highly polished and i don't think it's worth it take it back to the people if you stop thinking about the dollars equated to it for one minute and you go back to that customer centric what do they want what are they asking for who are we as a brand and what do we need them to know i think 
you can achieve so much yeah, more. And how do I connect with my customer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we'll talk a little bit more off air so I don't give everything away, but uh, small budget company, you can't do what Springfield Armory did. But say SHOT Show doesn't happen. Could you do one-tenth of that? Yeah, totally because could. you have that budget and do now. do we have the relationships mm -hmm. to get 10 companies mm -hmm. together and pool a replacement SHOT Show event together? You do. Is, is that something, Jessica, you're working with companies right now on? Planning smaller scale stuff? Yes, for sure. Um, because that's the, I know you saw the car launch mm -hmm. thing. They have to be really strategic. That's the only way they can go to market right now because of all the restrictions. So the smaller things are definitely a key focus. Now, this is a question that I think we're going to have maybe some different answers. I've talked to Jonathan about it. It's 2020. About to be 2021. You're a brand. This, fuck, this is a conversation I'd love that the NSSF would have at a, at a panel <laughs> meeting. I would love this. 2021, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody's going to celebrate when that page turns. But we'll start with Jessica. We'll start with the lady in the room. You're building a marketing department. What are the right pieces if you're a brand and you're saying, we need, to, we need to look at all this. We need to reevaluate this. Where do you start? What are the right hires? You know, what are the right components? Because I look at it and I'll, I'll, I'll throw chum in the water. And I say, you need a great content creator. You need someone who can be a creator. You need someone who can be a lead person. Okay? A little bit of entertainment, a little bit of this. Where do you start? What are the pieces? What are the pieces of the puzzle to build around? Well, I feel like you, I, I'm just going to air quotes the role marketing manager. I think you need someone with a vision, someone who's mapping out what the brand is, what the goals are of the brand, how the brand relates to the customer, all of those things, the vision, whatever that title is called, and who's going to map that out. The rest is who's going to help you bring that to life. And if content creation, I do think that it depends on what your product is, but if we're saying a firearm, Content creation, I think, is extremely relevant and important right now. I would, I'm in events, and I wouldn't say, like, oh, you immediately need an event coordinator. No. Let's figure out what the brand is, what type of content you're putting out, and where it makes sense. What events do you go to? I don't know yet. If you're in startup mode, there's a lot to figure out there. Um, maybe, maybe swags, your first attack or whatever. You know, at Q, we, we weren't like, oh, we have to be at all these trade shows. We targeted doing hats t-shirts all the stuff that would go along with it range bags whatever it was um, but we had a vision first of what we wanted the brand to be and then how we brought that brand to life was step number two so I think those are the first two notches in it what do you say Matt I, I would agree um you know it's, a, it's I think there's a little bit of a dance too that you, you have oh, to do there's a dance yeah. <laughs> um you know, having a having a uh, a plan is is good, and you know it's it's left and right and up oh, and down, yeah. and it's it's never easy. It's not like, hey, we're going to go from A to A to R. Nah, wrong. Um, but being able to learn from that and and adapt quickly, yep. uh, I think those are that that's probably part three or step yep. three of listen. We know it's not going to go to plan. You yeah. know, what what do we have? Mm -hmm. What can we do? What are we going to do? But I think having a plan. You have to start key. with a plan. Because there's a lot of people who I, are like, I don't need marketing. Yeah, yeah. Or someone in charge of that. Sales will just figure it out. And then it's like, no one wears those mm -hmm. two hats well, but every company in the gun industry thinks that they're the same. They're one yep. and the same. They're completely oh. different departments. <laughs> and it conflicts constantly. It's like oh, yeah. Oh. The two. <laughs> Internal Sales is, the is not marketing, is not advertising. Yeah. They're all different animals. And that's when you have to have that fight, that's a terrifying fight in the room. I've literally been in the room and been shocked. I've lost jobs over this, okay? I've been shocked at the amount of companies, before I throw it to Jonathan for his answer, that I've asked the question, yeah, what's the plan? And you would think I asked for fucking Jehovah's Witness. Like, you would think I asked for the craziest shit. They looked at me like, what do you mean? I'm like, do we have a deck? Do we have a storyboard? <laughs> any like what's something on a napkin something on a nap like <laughs> and they looked at me this I'm, I'm gonna call it i don't give a fuck but i'm gonna call it out literally the last place i was at i asked what's the plan they were insulted that i asked what the plan like insulted what do you mean 
I'm like, what's the plan? So I've lived through it. So just because you have a product doesn't mean you're a company. And it doesn't mean you're a <laughs> yeah. brand. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not picking on anyone or, or you know, where you were. Um, oh, you can pick on. But we see that a lot, or, or I see it a lot of, yeah, well, we make this. And, well, you're, 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 yeah, you're so not a company. Yeah, so why should I buy it? Why do I need that? Right. Just because I make Where's it doesn't mean. Uh, Plus if there's we, 10 of you. Why, why should I buy yours over Yeah, the what, what's the difference? You know? yeah. If you build it, they'll come. <laughs> Great movie. So, Great. Jonathan, I throw it to you. You know, maybe you're building a marketing department, which you're going through now, actually, which yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. What's the first steps? Maybe what do you outsource first? What's, where does it begin? Very first, I call uh, Chad Christopher from Greenlight Shooting. Shout out. Mm. Uh, content creation. High quality content creation that's going to live forever on YouTube. Good videos with a storyline that are not mag dumps in the desert. Good videos with, with vision. Somebody that sees your vision, like you said, bring in a marketing manager, a leader that's going to be able to have that vision and make sure that all the other pieces below it root up to that vision. Um, but first, I'm going to contract that out. Content creation uh, or in-house, you know, like you're doing enough of it that it can be in-house and, and keep that there. But uh, content creation would be the first part because if you don't have that content, you don't have anything to work with. Mm -hmm. Secondly is going to be somebody – that uh, in the interview, you can sit down and say, call the most important person you know that can be influential. Oh, you stole that from me. I did. <laughs> and if, if they can't call anybody, they don't get the job. Mm -hmm. But that's got to be an interview question for, for one person on a marketing team. And if they can't roll through the Rolodex and call somebody that would impress you, what's the point? So that's, that's, uh, that's another person that I'm going to have on. I'd call John. Do you think I'd get the job? Oh yeah! Fuck <laughs> my life. I'd say call Matt. But the uh, wait, 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 wait. Go ahead, go ahead. And then the analytical side. Somebody that's running your email campaigns and making sure those are bringing in revenue. Google AdWords, if you're able to play in that space. Amazon. Yep, that data those is are king. All bringing revenue, and you've got to understand that revenue or that data, and then translate it into more sales and get, become more efficient every month, every year. Um, and with those pieces, man, I like where you're at. I like that. I would say this, okay? If you're starting out and you just have a marketing director and a, an owner and it's a prayer, from there, it's a prayer. Maybe you've got a graphic designer. Maybe a graphic designer, photographer. Maybe you've got a web person. I don't know. But you have two or three pieces, which is how we see most companies, right, when they're starting out. It's kind of where they are. Maybe they're outsourcing the photography. But in building, they maybe have a video guy, a marketing manager, and maybe like you said, a data person that does the newsletters. That's pretty common. We see that a lot. You have to design a formula around what your pillar content is going to be, what your key piece is going to be. So I push and have pushed a lot of brands recently towards YouTube for a simple reason. If you create that pillar piece on YouTube, that's five, eight, 10 minutes long, your songbird content, whatever you want to call it, your entertainment slash skew piece, whatever it's going to be. You can then chop that and use those pieces on not just Instagram, but anywhere else, TikTok, anywhere else you want it to live and breathe. But you have to start to begin to create your plan around, hey, given the resources we have, and that's a term a lot of marketing directors need to develop, because if I'm sitting with Matt and Matt's my boss and we're sitting at Enforce, I'm going to say, Matt, given what you're giving me, this is what I think we can create and we can do the most effectively in a repeatable format, mm -hmm. okay, that's consistent with a message. But yes, we can sit here and do pie in the sky all day of this and that, but this is what I can create consistently. And you do a deck, and it starts with a deck. And then from there begins the genesis of a content creation strategy and what that'll look like over a period of time. But to Jonathan's point and Jessica's point, it's not something that happens in one day. We have to commit to it over six or eight months. Or longer. At a minimum, before we even look at the data. And I think that's something that, Matt, if you were hiring me tomorrow, you'd be like, I can live with that. I can chew on that. But it amazes me how many marketing directors come in, and I ask a simple question on these conference calls all the time. What's your content creation strategy? And they look at you like, what do you mean? Mm. What does that even mean? How did these people get through marketing school? I didn't go to school for marketing. Here I am. But it amazes me. 
It's probably similar to the conversations you have when it's say, what's your goal of the booth? Yeah. And tell me I'm, I'm crazy. You have crickets. What do you mean? There are a lot of people that don't have their, their reason for going because they need presence in the industry. And that's the wrong reason. If you're going anywhere and it's just to say, I'm in this industry and exist. Hear me roar. That's the wrong. Yeah. That's the wrong answer. That expense. Stay home. Yeah. So the question I have is simple. Once the team's built and you're starting step one and you're, you're trying to build an identity, why is it such a struggle for some of these quote-unquote marketing directors and wizards of the industry to come up with a brand story, which is something I know that you harp on, Jessica, to, with a lot of brands. You know, what's your brand story? What's, why, why is that such a – and I, and I have a theory on it. It's because a lot of these companies are run by engineers, and we've been in that room, Matt, mm -hmm. where they're like, look at the widget. I just, the rail is 0. .6 <laughs> lighter. What do you mean? <laughs> but that can't be the story. That's not the story. No, the story is digging deeper. Why does it need to be lighter? Is it some special weapon going a blah, 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 and it needs to weigh this? Like, there's got to be more meat on the bone than that, and I'm sure there is. It's just that marketing person needs to poke, pry, beg, rip they, the they, hair out of those gonna engineers have to, dig to get deep. it. Yeah. Yeah. they got to be a, a part of that family on the inside, and they have to understand. Yeah. They have to really get whatever the vision is that maybe it's a CEO or maybe it's a, a certain engineer. It, it or comes back to leadership at the top. The owner has to come out of the sarcophagus it's and he needs down. to say, hey, you know, this is why I started this brand and this is why I started this company. But to get them to come out of the sarcophagus is part of the fucking problem. Yeah, I, I say uh, one, one big reason for that, it all starts with uh, – People aren't spending the necessary money into content creation, into quality content creation. So how do you tell that story or how do you come up with that story if you don't have the talent in place to do it? You can, I think you can do that with digestible bites. Like yeah. for me, I can't, if, if there's a video that's like over 90 seconds, I'm not watching it. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, I don't have the, the attention span to do you it. the you, clips. You, yeah. You put <laughs> something on and like you said, you can take it and put it into smaller bites. Take like you do on the show, take an hour, take two hours and do small clips and, yep. and that's good. But you know, putting out a, a, a 30 minute video of, off the cuff. Ugh, yeah. No, no. that's We're why first, that's why to me, the pillar piece is the most critical. What are your pillar pieces going to be? And a pillar piece can be a range day. I'm not dispelling. I'm not saying that it can't be that. But it has to be chopped up into palatable, you know, why did we do a range day? What's the point? What are we trying to accomplish? What's the goal? What's the, you know, in interviewing some of the people. And an editor, to me, if we would add a fourth piece to the, to the puzzle of how to build a team, an editor, to me, is worth gold in the industry. If you can find someone who's really quick and to Jessica's point, they're out there. Oh, yeah. I, I don't have to tell her what I pay for my Kids clips. Kids are wizards now. Wizards. They do everything and, 10 times faster than And you can of us. find a wizard out there that can cut you some really palatable stuff that you can really capitalize. We've talked about this, Matt. You do a, 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 a day. It's a bit of a carnival. Having someone out there that can chop you and edit your clips is like fucking, what would you pay for this gold? They're, they're beyond valuable. And to get it quick and to get it out there in good content. If you do, if you do an event and you wait three months to put clips out. Nobody cares. Yeah. yeah. It's old news. I also think another benefit in this industry to keeping it internal is when somebody is part of your brand and part of their story and knows everything you embody, knows the things you like to show, but also not show mm. that's more manageable when you're outsourcing it. You have to be the buffer of that. Like, let me yeah. review every single thing that they're yeah. editing to make sure it's our product shown in the right light. When you have someone in house, it's a different story. Yeah, especially if they can if understand they, the vision. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. A lot of education into contract work. A lot of education. If it's going to be a contractor. It's a heavy lift. It's if education, you're small. And then it has to be a committed relationship for, oh, for a sure. long period of time. I'm in a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jessica, you said something last time I want to bring back to you. You oh, said, boy. no, no, you said this in the podcast. I did my <laughs> research. No. You said, if you're going to take a shot, take a shot. You know, take a shot with marketing sometimes. And where those shots are taken or advertising, whatever it may be, um, we've seen a rise, obviously, in podcasting and in some pockets, companies, because of COVID. Yep. People are getting into it. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, it's, I think it's a good place to take a shot for a period of time because a lot of people don't understand it in consulting and buying ad space and some of those and starting to learn it and understand it is a good spend. Where else do you see good spots for brands to take shots right now or what might be a good avenue to take a shot that maybe companies aren't looking at yet or should be looking at or putting a toe in the water that you see out there? Take a shot and doing anything you haven't before. <laughs> I think every every avenue there's a possibility. Stop following the corporate norms and you know, get a little raw if it's on if it's digital if it's in your. Content. Remember you said that to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, that's gonna be one of the clips, isn't it? <laughs> Could be. Just be willing to lift up your skirt a little and put something out there that maybe. Not something you're going to retract. I wouldn't say go super risky, but it's okay for people to know that humans work at your company and your brand has people who work there every day. You don't have to follow the dusty marketing book. If that's going on a mobile tour and bringing the event to your customers, fine, that's your risk. If that's saying something on social media that you wouldn't have normally unveiled but you think's important now, then do it there. I mean, there's a million ways to do it. It's take a little risk. The new generation of shooters, like you're saying, wants to purchase a product or be a part of a brand because of the person behind it, because of the face that you're, yeah. you're the company culture. So like you're saying, like, it's okay to have your company have employees and, and yeah, see and that they're people. Yeah, and be human, they real. They do this and that. And yeah, so I think, I think that's a big part of what the market is becoming because that new generation of shooters, they want to be a part of the brand as a whole yeah and if and if you have incomplete pieces or just missing on a lot of fronts i think you're going to miss a lot of the new business that's coming map yes <laughs> now when you look at that and you hear their answers dust off the marketing book you bet you're in an established brand what do you see for established brands and is that maybe too much of a risk uh, again, it depends on the size and, and who you are and where you are. Um, you know, some places need to just throw that book out completely mm. and just start over. Um, there's a lot of flamethrowers that need to go around. Uh, <laughs> there, there's, you know, if, if there was a standard book of marketing, there's some key things that every company has to do and has to understand. Mm -hmm. um, you can take those and, and bring them in, but uh, to your point, you've got to take a little bit of a risk. And sometimes doing something do anything, um, even if you're like, hey, don't be afraid to fail. It's okay. Like, wow, are we going to upset the customers? You got to do something. You really do. You can't, you can't be stale anymore. You can't, you can't rest on your laurels, and you've got to be a little more interactive. There's a lot of talk about paywalls. I want to touch on this fast. Are paywalls a viable option for everybody? Are, you know, these types of um, elite programs, you know, we've alluded to them in terms of like, you know, reaching out to your segments, but where do paywalls fit in now? I mean, I mean, look, OnlyFans. Oh, I was just going to yeah, say. I mean, fucking OnlyFans like, Only is, like, is killing it. Yeah, OnlyFans <laughs> is killing it. But do you think that paywalls are being drastically overlooked? Should they be looked at by the industry? Should that be something considered? I think baby steps. You know, if you come up with a, a marketing plan that's good and everything's going right and you think that you have content that's worth paying for maybe but i don't think we're there yet yeah i think it depends on the content i i know uh max michelle started it he's uh, he's on patreon with uh subscriptions to get private training from him mm -hmm. and so he's got a vip group that he works with monthly and posts videos to them working on their dry fire, working on their, their reloads and trying to improve them. And he's doing it from a training it's aspect, a value right? add. Yeah. It's a value add. I, that and for sense. that paywall makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I think of it when you talk about paywalls, I think of why 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the NRA or the NSSF oh, don't fucking didn't get start. with it with everybody. You put some type of big money behind a paywall that is, the all Netflix the competitive shooting, us. USPSA, <laughs> yeah, seriously, and then all that live streaming, like, you, you could have done it by now, but there's not been an effort. It, it's amazing, and I'm not even going to start. John gets, yeah. go, go, I'm not going to start. <laughs> Matt, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, it was just, it was, go ahead. You want to hear it? Yeah, I want to hear it. <laughs> all right, you want to hear I'm going to make you say it. Him on. Five years ago, if Recoil TV had stuck to its guns and continued down its path, they would have absolutely had something. 
Instead, there was a pocket of time that they abandoned it for whatever reason and didn't stick with it. And I think they tried to turn everything into a product commercial. And that's part of the fucking mistake. And everything, whether it's NRA, USS, USCCA, they try to turn everything into, but you'll get a free pouch. <laughs> Instead of it being, let us tell you a story, which is something you talk about, Jessica. Let us give you something that's impactful. Let, you, let us give you something that's value add. And I think paywalls would have done phenomenal with certain, to your point, Matt, you always bring up, certain brands with where they are. Okay? And I think that there are companies that could do very well with paywalls. And there are people that do very well. I'm not going to get an OnlyFans. But there are people that do very well. That was a separate episode. That do very well with paywalls. And I think that there are a place for them. NRA is a great example. I thought NRA had a golden opportunity to unite the clans, to put an IPSC or IDPA paywall up. They could have streamed, and instead of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with Ackerman McQueen, could have put that money into actually uniting the shooting sports industry yeah. behind a paywall, and they could be getting nine ninety nine a member or four ninety nine a member. Easy, Matt, come on. All day. All I day. Guess. You won't even know it's gone. You won't even yeah. know it's okay. gone. And they could have had 20, 30, 40,000 subscribers in their sleep if they put that money behind the production. And it's like investing in, I, in an IRA. Don't even act like it's there. Put the money into it, and they would have hit a home run. I'm not going to get into brands I worked with that would be absolutely crushing it right now in the content creation department if they had stayed the course. But the problem is they start to get into words they don't really understand, which are things like ROI and things like they don't fully see it until it pays off. But they want it to pay off immediately. It's like they want to get laid on the first date. We got to get it tonight. Dude, like I've always said, it's, it, for, for me and, and for us, it's more of a long game. There's, you know, you got to stop looking for that immediate return. I don't think it exists. Like if you're swinging for the home run right now and I'm a brand, I'm going to put it out there. My formula. You are insane if you're a brand and you don't on YouTube or in one of these spaces put some type of cop show or Leo show. There is not one show on TV right now because they all got run off. Right. right? And endear yourself to that community. Is that community going to go out and spend tons of money? No. But I guarantee you'll win the hearts and minds really fucking quickly if there's something in there. It might not pay off today, but six months from now, eight months from now, that community will remember who stuck by them and who put a program out there that said whether it was like cops, whether it was like some, some type of programming, but you have to stick to it. It has to be multiple episodes, multiple conversations. Imagine a show right now that was just, say, two retired cops just talking about what's going on right now in law enforcement. Between the cuffs. Between, yeah. Here's your name. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever. TN. <laughs> but you'd absolutely hit a home run. But it's, it's, that's a bit of a shot, right? That's like, let's take a shot. And what do 12 episodes cost you to produce? I don't Pennies. know. Pennies, right? But why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? If I'm the NRA, that is a natural community for you mm -hmm. to endear yourself to. If I'm USCCA, that is a natural community to endear yourself to. Whether or not it goes behind a paywall is another conversation. But I think it's the start of something. It's the, the chum. If I'm Recoil TV, how about some original fucking programming? Yeah. It's a thought. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that would be a very good suggestion for them. I think they would do very well with that. Tell me I'm crazy, Jessica. I just think you're having cops withdrawals. I don't think you're crazy. <laughs> cops is coming back on air, I think. Oh, boy. I'm getting him a t-shirt. John Langley has his way. It will. <laughs> but, I mean, I just think that's a natural, if you want to say, like, wh what's the forecasting? What would be something that would be a bit of a shot? Yeah. If I'm a brand, if I'm, say, SIG looking at my YouTube, if I'm Recoil TV looking at my channeling, if I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of brands it might be a fit for, you know, if I'm looking out into the space, what could pay off big six, eight, 12 months from now? Mm -hmm. 
to me, something like that is a fucking no brainer, but. I don't disagree with you. I think if there was, like, the Netflix of this industry, that'd be the first place I'd go to look for content, right? I'd be like, oh, I'm laying in bed. Let me just go watch whatever's on whatever this is called. Between the cuffs. I Mm. think that you thinking a brand is going to start this is probably a pipe dream because that would mean that everyone would have to play nice in the sandbox, and that's not reality. But if it's NSSF or NRA or somebody like that, the conglomerate that does touch all of these brands, then that's that's possible. I see that as a thing, but then you'd be asking them to get with the time. So, yeah, it has to Baby be that steps. conglomerate, and and I mean, if Recoil is going to do it, then it's got to be every brand. Like it can't be. Yeah, you have to play fair. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. Listen, did we cover enough? It's <laughs> two hours. I got a Whoa. your mama joke. <laughs> well, go ahead. Your mama's so ugly. They had to fake a pandemic to get her to cover her face. Oh, my God. That's horrible. Wow. That's horrible. I was going to go get a sandwich so this could be like a mukbang and a podcast episode. No, in one. no, no. We'll wrap. <laughs> Listen, I want to give everybody their last thoughts. I want to go around the horn. What do we do as an industry? What's the, what's the step? What's the next step as an industry? that we have to take. That's a must take. I think you gotta bring everyone together. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you gotta, you know, the competition is always good, but uh, you know, the, the putting everyone else down and you know, it's just that negative behavior and the negative attitude isn't, isn't helping anybody. Mm. We so need think, good sportsmanship. Yeah, just come together <laughs> a little bit more as a community, that's all. A little more love. Yeah. What do you say, Jessica? I agree with that. Um, some unity would probably help if SHOT Show is not going to happen. I think we need to start throwing out some of that old stuff and knowing that change is good. Look at that in a more positive light, in a less fearful way. And I hate to keep saying pivot, but it's okay to try something new and take a little bit of a risk. There is proof of these things working. It's just outside of the firearms industry. So take some of that and apply it to what you're doing on the day-to-day. I'd say taking uh, the big budget you use for the big trade shows and the 50 to 70 other trade shows you're doing across the country between LA Mill and commercial all year long. And if those end, if that's what we're looking at next year in 2021, then take that money and invest it into proper media events, client events where it's just your company, maybe three others, four others. Focused and focus that spend and have the same people there, but everything's dialed into your product, not your 10 by 10. And deliver a more strategic message of why this benefits you. Not why it benefits brand, but why does it benefit the customer? Educational content. Take care of the customer. I agree with all of you. (laughs) I do. You know where I stand. I think there needs to be more constructive dialogue, and we have to be okay with having that dialogue. Mm Mm-hmm. I think there's too many people that their feelings get hurt. Oh, like, I can't believe he said that. Or boo fucking who. Enemies don't happen unless a pipe gets shoved up your ass. <laughs> okay? Comfortable being uncomfortable? The reality is change doesn't come easy. But until we're willing to have an open and honest dialogue about, hey, what's the plan? Without someone getting offended or someone running in the bushes. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do here? I think as it pertains to me, people get a certain feeling like, oh, he's going to come in here with a flamethrower. He's going to be this or he's going to be that. Or it's the delivery. But I think the reality is having an open, honest conversation and be willing to have the tough back and forth is going to lead to great things. And whether or not the gray hair in the room gets upset or their feelings get hurt. Oh, but my idea was we were going to buy this ad. I mean, come on. You have to be willing for someone to stand up and say, I don't know. Why don't we look at this? And there's no better time than now to Jonathan's point about having that extra spend. There's no better time than now to take a chance, in my opinion, on something maybe, hey, at the very least, we're feeding the meter. Yeah, give, give, me, give me 20 grand. Let me try something brand new. Mm-hmm. 
If it doesn't work, hey, you know what? I tried. Yeah. And we own the content. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's yours. It's yours. Feed the meter. Or call Jessica and say, hey, I'm doing an event in Rhode Island. I want to put a, a, a good experience together. I'm going to have X amount of people together. What do you think? Yep. But it takes looking in the mirror. It takes being like, maybe we're not the best marketing department. Mm-hmm. Maybe we need to do a little analysis. And if people take what I'm saying or what I put out there as like, offend, oh, fucking offended, Jesus Christ. Let me jump in the bushes and fucking drown myself in gasoline. I mean, give me a fucking break. In, in every other industry, it's not like that crazy. You know what I mean? It's really not. And I agree with Jonathan said earlier. I think some of the rainmakers or some of the people that are key people in these companies that these companies at this time get scared and they run from marketing. I think it's a catastrophic mistake. A catastrophic mistake. You might have to pivot to use Jessica's language and look at something like advertising or spend because maybe you don't have it in building Mm -hmm. and that's fine too. But don't be afraid to look at a space that maybe you don't fully understand. And that might take an advertising buy or a consulting buy to look at, but look at it. I got people that come in here constantly that are like, I want to just take pictures of the equipment. I want to kind of understand this. I want to maybe look at this. But if you're not considering the 12th man, if you will, or you're not looking at that, then you're fucking crazy. That's my story. Anything else? Anybody? Bueller? Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you get anything? Good. It's a good first. Time. It's a fucking time. first. <laughs> Let's eat. <laughs> Listen, we're going to sign off. I'm going to kill everything. I appreciate everyone. I'll put all the links down below to everyone's brands and what they're all about and everything in between. We John's went two only hours. Fans. My OnlyFans <laughs> will be listed. Nobody wants to see me do a naked cartwheel, I promise you. We're out. <laughs>